Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome. My name is Samir Shah, and I'm an MA partner in Khaitan's Corporate MA Group. Welcome back to the second webinar in the second edition of our MA Academy program. We had 10 exceptionally successful webinars last year and have had one webinar last month. As always, the aim and objective is to provide legal knowledge at a foundational level so that there is better understanding on MA transactions and processes. And our target audience, as always, are corporate executives, in house legal teams and other m a ecosystem participants. As I've said before, the feedback has consistently and continuously been so encouraging, both from our live audience as well as from people who've seen our videos on YouTube, that this has motivated us to renew the program and of course introduce new topics and formats. Our subject today is m a by scheme of arrangement. Last year, while we had a session, for our m a master's series on the subject, the m a Academy didn't carry a session on schemes. We, we simply just didn't have enough space. But there was overwhelming feedback to cover that as a concept as well. Schemes are typically used in restructuring matters, but can also be used very innovatively for m a transactional work. Therefore, we have curated today's session for precisely that purpose, and we will cover the basics and also cover some case studies. As always, we will have a formal presentation followed by Q&A. Please feel free to submit your questions on an ongoing basis in the Q&A chat box, and we will pick them up at the end of the presentation. Whatever we cannot address as a part of our webinar today, we will respond offline over email after the webinar, and all questions will be addressed, and the presentation, summary notes, and the recording will be shared with all participants by email, and needless to say, the recording of the session will also be introduced, uploaded on YouTube. With that, let me introduce our speaker today. We have with us my partner, Bhavin Vora. He is based out of our Mumbai offices, although he works on projects nationally. He has more than 15 years of MA experience. While we circulated his profile over email to the participants who registered with us, Nonetheless, just to mention that he is an experienced and knowledgeable practitioner and has advised several large clients, including the likes of JSW, Edelweiss, and IIFL. So, without further ado, I now invite Bhavin to deliver his presentation. Bhavin, over to you. Thank you, Samir. The topic for today's discussion is MA by Scheme of Arrangement. In today's webinar, we will cover our various topics. Uh, first and foremost, what is, why is there a need for any corporate to do an m &A? What are the advantages of doing m a through scheme? What are the different types of m a which can be done through a scheme of arrangement? What is the process involved? What are the approvals required to do an m a through a scheme of arrangement? And lastly, we'll also touch upon a few of the case studies explaining you know, how the m a can be done through a scheme of arrangement. Uh, let us first look at what are the reasons or what are the objectives for which corporates will look at doing an m a there are multiple objectives for which a corporate group may either consider an m a or reorganization the most common reason for someone or any corporate will look at doing an m a is consolidation of business there can be different objectives of consolidation to achieve the inorganic growth to increase the market presence or to achieve the business synergies take an example of vodafone idea merger the Vodafone idea merger was done to increase the market share of the combined entity. And as we all know, the transaction was consummated through a scheme of arrangement where the, one of the entity was merged as part of the scheme, scheme process. Again, the another reason why for which corporates will look at doing m a is to facilitate fundraising or segregation of business. I have to take an example for one of the client. It actually demerged the institutional broking business from one of the entity into a separate entity with an intent to ultimately exit from the institutional broking business. So again, an exit or fundraising can also be achieved through a scheme of arrangement. Another reason why corporates look at doing m a is unlocking value. So for example, we have seen a lot of precedents where listed entity do a demerger with an objective to segregate businesses and achieve two listed entities doing two separate kind of businesses. Luckily, we have been part of so many such exercises where we have unlocked value by doing a demerger of two businesses and getting two entities listed through a scheme of arrangement process. Again, likewise, there are multiple other reasons like 
uh, to improve the overall effective tax rate of the group if there are multiple cross holdings to try and eliminate cross holding to achieve a streamlined holding structure so there could be various reasons for which a corporate may look at doing an m a or reorganization and those will obviously in the next slide we'll discuss what are the advantages of doing this kind of m a through a scheme of arrangement the question would come up is why should someone look at doing an m a through a scheme of arrangement and not do it in a traditional way of doing an m a so one of most important advantage of doing an m a through scheme is there are certain tax benefits which are available if you do an m a through a scheme of arrangement take an example if you have to do any kind of mergers or demergers typically all kind of merger and demergers are tax exempt either for the entities which are involved in the restructuring as well as for the shareholders who are involved as part of the restructuring there are certain benefits which are given under the income tax law where which can be achieved only through a scheme of arrangement take an example if one of the entity involved in the restructuring has brought forward tax losses or there are certain tax incentives or exemption which are claimed by that entity those brought forward losses or tax incentives can be transferred to a new entity uh, through a scheme of arrangements so if you have to do a merger or demerger those losses can continue subject to uh, compliance of certain conditions the another advantage of doing a scheme is to give an if retrospective effect to an to a transaction say we are we want to do a transaction in the month of march can this be done in a traditional way answer is no but under a scheme there is a provision that you can provide the appointed date uh, from which the transaction would be taken into effect and if we have an appointed date of 1st april 2022 in the in this scheme of arrangement then once the transaction is approved by the tribunal once we have all the approvals in place accounting for that can happen from 1st april 2022 so the retrospective effect can also be designed in the scheme of arrangement again there are certain benefits in terms of lower transaction costs what we have seen uh, in most of the states in india that the stamp duty which is payable on the normal transaction document versus the stamp duty which is payable if you have to do a transaction through a scheme and especially a transaction where there are substantial immobile properties which will get transferred pursuant to a restructuring and generally the stamp duty which is payable on the scheme of our scheme document is lower compared to a normal agreement so you know transit lower transaction cost is also an reason why one could consider doing an m a through a scheme lastly since the scheme requires an approval of tribunal and other regulators there is an ease one you get a sanctity or a order of a tribunal giving effect confirming a transaction so there's a legal validity to a transaction which has been done separately you don't need to do any other agreements to transfer a business take an example if you to novate contracts which are there in one entity into a new entity or if there are involved properties typically transfer of involved will require an execution of conveyance deed if you have to do it in a traditional way but in the scheme all those contracts can be novated without any separate document those involved properties can be transferred to a resultant entity without executing any conveyance deed if there are any licenses which are there if the business which you want to transfer or acquire is regulated and there are licenses or the approvals which are required to do a business typically and in most of the cases you will be able to transfer those approvals and licenses by based on the court order so you can draft a scheme in a manner where there will be deeming provision which can be included to say all the licenses or approvals which are obtained by one entity are deemed to be transferred to a new entity once we get a court order that is also an advantage of doing and I mean it through a scheme. So next, and again, one more reason where people, especially the list entries, should consider doing a scheme is it's a better way of presenting the corporate governance. If you are doing a transaction where the promoters are also involved, and then doing it through a scheme kind of gives up, shows that the company are looking for a better corporate governance because this scheme needs to be approved by the shareholders of the listed entity. It will go through the tribunal process, whereas part of the process will also require approval from various regulatory authorities so again from a governance standpoint doing it through a scheme kind of it can be seen as a transparent way of doing a restructuring especially if the promoters are also involved in the restructuring the next question which will obviously will come up with if there are advantages of doing an m a through a scheme 
why would all transaction not be done under a scheme why would people still consider doing a transaction in a traditional way or through an agreement are uh, there are certain other consideration which one need to consider or keep in mind before we can kind of conclude that scheme is a better way of doing a transaction or no the first and foremost is as we discuss there are various approvals which are required for any scheme of arrangement to go through other than the tribunal approval will also require an approval from shareholders and or creditors of the entities which are involved in the restructuring will also require an approval from regional director registrar of companies and certain other regulator depending on the the, the business in or a sector in which those entities are operating so typically what we have seen is depending on whether the entity involved are unlisted entity or listed entity are restructuring through an mna or transaction restructuring through a scheme could take anywhere between 6 to 12 months so that is one factor which one should keep in mind the another important element uh, is that the scheme uh, scheme document is a public document which means anyone can access this scheme document and read through the the this scheme so again you know depending on the the criticality of the transaction whether we want the companies want those document to be available in public or no is also an important criteria to decide whether you know one should do this through through a traditional way or should we do it through a scheme of arrangement as anyone can access this scheme of arrangement and read through the document the another important consideration which also is critical uh, to determine whether scheme would uh, be a better structure or no is a approval required of majority of minority and this is true where a listed entity is involved in certain kind of restructuring and not all you require a special approval of majority of minority shareholders so take an example if you are doing a restructuring where promoters are also involved there is an issue of additional shares to a promoter through any restructuring you will specially require an approval of majority of minority and this kind of scheme can only be implemented uh, if you obtain a favorable approval from majority of the minority shareholders so again while there are lot significant advantages of doing an mna through scheme one also need to consider the uh, keep in mind the other consideration around time required or document being available in public domain and the majority or minority approval which may be required in certain cases to before we decide whether one should do a scheme or not to you know to do any kind of mna let us now understand what are the different types of mna which can be done through a scheme the general perception uh, is that if one is to do a merger or demerger then only i need to look about think about scheme so only if and if you are doing any other kind of mna other than merger or demerger typically people don't think about scheme but that's not true in today's world practically any kind of mna or reorganization can be done through a scheme take an example of business purchase if there is a client who wants to acquire a real estate project or any other project which has a significant approvals or licenses which are required to operate the business then there are two ways to do it one can simply do it by executing a business transfer agreement or there is a possibility where the business transfer can also happen through a scheme of arrangement why would one look at doing a business transfer through a scheme of arrangement possibly it's you know business transfer through a scheme helps you to transfer those approvals and licenses in a smooth manner we don't need to execute different contracts or agreements for transferring assets like contracts immobile properties to a new entity it can be transferred by or of a court order as we discussed earlier in certain states there is a lower stamp duty payable if there are substantial immobile properties which needs to change hands pursuant to a transaction and we have seen there are a lot of precedents where companies have done a business transfer through a scheme of arrangement uh, take another example share acquisition we also done a scheme and we have also been part of the scheme where we had done a segregation of business from one entity into a two entity and followed by a sales swap as part of the scheme so once the demerger has happened the sales swap was also done as part of the scheme for certain other considerations uh, if we were to also look at the other structure and i will not look at on uh, discuss all but take an example of bonus issuance of shares typically people would assume that a comp if a company has to issue a bonus shares we can simply pass a board resolution and a shareholder resolution and be done with it however certain kind of bonus issuance for example bonus preferences or bonus non convertible debentures 
those kind of bonuses can only be done through a scheme if you have any of the shareholder who is a non-resident. So there is a circular under foreign exchange regulations which says that if a company has to issue a bonus preferences or bonus debentures to a non-resident shareholder, it can only be done if you are doing it through a scheme of arrangement. Again, we have seen a transaction. Take an example: if there are two JV, two JV partners in a company, one of the partner wants to exit, and they want to utilize the surplus funds which are available in the company to give an exit to one of the partner. The simple would have option would have been that the other JV partner acquires the shares and give an exit, but then I can't use the funds which are available in the company. Or we can do a scheme by virtue of which can can cancel or purchase the shares which is held by the partner wants to exit. As part of the scheme and discharge the consideration, in which case we can utilize the surplus funds which are available with the company to distribute or give an exit to one of the JV partners. So there could be various type of transaction which can be done through a scheme, and we have just touched upon few of these transactions other than merger or demerger, which can also be executed or done through a scheme. Let us now understand what are the various regulation which would impact this scheme. Once you understood the rational advantages and the other consideration, one also need to understand that the scheme which we want to implement kind of complies with the various regulation which are applicable. Take an example: if you have a non-resident shareholder as part of the transaction, or if you want to merge a foreign entity with an Indian entity which is now permitted under foreign exchange regulations, one need to also be mindful of the in conditions which are prescribed under foreign exchange regulations around pricing guidelines or conditions which are prescribed for cross border merger that the entity which is merging should not have any borrowing or if it has a borrowing it should comply with the other regulations so we just need to be mindful of the the mi click actions if there is a non resident who is involved similarly take an example for a listed entity is involved when a listed entity is involved Over and above the tribunal approval, which we spoke about, we will also require an approval from SEBI and Stock Exchange before we kind of implement the scheme in implement the scheme to complete the transaction. Again, over and above the approvals which are required, we may also need to be mindful of the other SEBI regulations. For example, as part of the scheme, if you are say merging a promoter entity with a listed entity, by virtue of which we want to issue additional shares. To the to the shareholders of promoter company, by then one also need to look at the LODR regulations and Tabor Code regulation under SEBI. There are certain pricing guidelines which one need to comply with if you want to issue shares to the promoters as part of the scheme. Or one also need to look at if there are any open offer or takeover code implications, or depending on the structure and depending on how much the promoter's holding would increase as part of the scheme. the another set of regulation which would impact is the regulation around sectoral guidelines to take an example again if there is an insurance company or bank or nbfc which are involved as part of the restructuring then over and above the approvals which are required under the scheme we may also require additional approval for transfer the those businesses to a new entity by virtue of merger or demerger uh similarly if there are uh businesses which are involved in the financial service sector as we all know uh, most of the financial service businesses are regulated by sebi so again if you are looking at doing a restructuring or entering into a transaction with where the entities are engaged in a financial service sector we may also require an approval of sebi over and above this scheme related approvals required other than this regulation one also need to consider the accounting implications of the transaction how will the the transaction would be recorded in the books of the company what are the stamp duty implication which will again depend on the register office of the companies depends on the whether those companies are involved properties or no so one also need to look at what is the overall cost which is involved if you have to do a scheme and we also obviously need to understand the tax implications while generally mergers and demergers are tax exempt certain type of transaction may have tax implication take an example of capital reduction which we just spoke about if you have to cancel the shares which is held by one set of shareholders there could be tax implication which one should be mindful of before we kind of proceed further let us now understand the process involved or to get a scheme approved once we have kind of designed or understood the transaction the first step would be to draft the scheme of arrangement scheme of arrangement is nothing but a contract um, between the two companies and their shareholders listing down what are the terms of the transaction what are the 
uh, accounting of the transaction we also need to be recorded again uh, if there is a merger of two entities we also need to provide a share exchange ratio in the scheme and which will also provide these cps which are required to be completed uh, before the scheme can be be made effective again uh, if there is a, as we discussed if there is a merger of two entities we will also require a valuation report which will kind of value both the entities involved in the restructuring and come up with a share exchange ratio which needs to be where the shares has to be issued by the other resultant entity to the shareholders of the transferor company and again under the sebi and company law regulations the accounting which has been mentioned in the scheme has to be certified by the auditor so auditor has to ensure that the accounting which has been written in the scheme is in compliance with the the applicable accounting standard and they have to certify that this is in accordance with the the applicable provision applicable accounting standard once we have all this in place all three document which is scheme valuation report and the auditor certificate has to be placed before the board and board will approve the scheme and as a next step uh, we then need to approach the nclt either to convey a shareholders and creditors meeting or ask for a dispensation of shareholder and creditors meeting and uh, depending on you know how much return consent if you are able to obtain a return consent from shareholders and or creditors beyond a prescribed value then nclt has a power to dispense with the shareholders and or creditors meeting if not typically nclt or tribunal will call for the meeting of shareholders and creditors meeting which has to be then approved by an appropriate majority which means a 75% in value and 50 more than 50% in numbers of the shareholders and or creditors need to approve the scheme and then as a next step we need to again approach the tribunal for a second motion where well, they will instruct the company to send out notices to all regulators like regional director registrar of companies or sectoral regulator if required and once all those regulations or approvals are in place tribunal will approve the scheme in the final hearing assuming there are no objections typically the scheme will get approved if there are any objection either from any of the stakeholders or regulator then tribunal will consider those regulations depending on the response which is filed by the company and if those responses are satisfactory the scheme gets approved again in case of listed entity you will need additional approval and as we discuss the time required can vary between 6 to 12 months let us now look at a few of the case studies our uh, first and foremost i uh, take a simple example there are two companies company x and company y both the companies are promoted by different set of promoters for some commercial reasons on um, both these shareholders of both the companies feel it appropriate that if we combine the operations of both the companies we'll be able to increase our market share and probably will also be able to generate a business synergy the question which would come up is if two set of shareholders want to consider the business is what is the right way to achieve this one of the simple way to achieve a consideration would be to merge company x and company y and obviously one need to determine which way should be merged are uh, depending on multiple regulations but at, as we discuss this kind of mergers are tax exempt for all these shareholders while we will merge both the entities and there will be an additional issuance of shares to one set of shareholders pursuant to a merger there are no tax implications for any of the entities that's the beauty of doing a consolidation through a scheme and also you don't need to execute any other documents or agreements to transfer the business and it can simply be transferred by virtue of a court order and hence you know one can consider doing a consolidation through through a scheme of arrangement uh let us now look at uh, one more example say there is a company uh, which has two businesses business a and business b uh, as we discussed earlier if there is an intent to exit from one of the business shareholder don't want so shareholder of company a doesn't want to continue in business b and they intend to ultimately exit from business b and whatever consideration which has been received at pass up as part of the exit the they would want those funds to be directly owned or held by the shareholders in their personal name instead of that money getting stuck in in the hands of company probably one structure which one can consider is to first split this into two uh, which means you demerge one of the business from company a into a new company as part of the demerger on uh, you can need to issue shares to the shareholders of company a which means the shareholders of company a once the demerger is complete will start owning shares of 
two entities company a which has business a and nuco which has business b and once the demerger is complete shareholder can exit by transferring shares of nuco to a identified buyer and we can either do a partial exit on full exit depending on the objective which the shareholder wants to achieve but doing a segregation through a demerger again is a nice way or a tax efficient way to split and probably have a lower transaction cost to split the business uh, let us now look at uh, one more example take us example where there is a listed entity uh, which is promoter and public and which again has two businesses both the businesses are in that sense different from each other they have no connection or synergy between the two the risk and reward for both kind of business is very different from each other the multiple which are prevailing to determine the valuation of both the businesses are also different and probably the set of investor would want to invest in business a or want to invest in business b may also be different depending on the risk profile of investors and hence we want to achieve a structure where we have a two separate entity housing two different businesses but at the same time also ensure that the shareholders of list co directly hold a stake in a new entity again we can consider a demerger from list co into a new company such that the promoters and public who are holding shares in list co in 70 30 ratio also achieve or hold the shares of nuco in the same ratio so you do a mirror demerger and issue shares of nuco to the shareholders again the beauty of this structure is that if you do a demerger or segregation of business through a scheme under the savvy regulation there is a provision where the nuco can be listed without actually following a ipo process typically if you want to list any business you need to do an ipo process whereas if you do a demerger where there is a mirror de shareholding which will get created pursuant to a demerger nuco can get listed pursuant to demerger obviously subject to compliance of certain conditions but there are enough precedents where people have done a segregation of businesses through a demerger and listing the new entity let us now go to our last case study for for the for the day and take an example there is a developer co which has a real estate project in mumbai he has taken a substantial borrowing to complete a project and he, he at this stage he doesn't want to continue the project and there is a buyer who is ready to acquire the business on as is where is basis along with the liabilities which are there in this project since there are substantial debt which are also related or allocated to a business the actual consideration which buyer need to pay to acquire a business is very insignificant again there are two ways to do this transaction either i can do a transaction through a simple business transfer agreement or i can still do a slum sale as part of the scheme and as we discussed earlier if you to do a slum sale through a scheme and especially in a real estate project which has a significant involved properties potentially there will be a lower stamp duty in most of the states compared to a stamp duty which will you which will you pay through on the agreement and since this project in in the state of maharashtra the maximum stamp duty which is payable in the state of maharashtra on any kind of scheme of arrangement is restricted to a 10% of value of consideration paid pursuant to a scheme and since we are looking to pay a nominal consideration as part of the transaction the overall stamp duty which would be payable on the scheme would again be insignificant irrespective of the value of immobile properties which you want to transfer from developer code to spv as part of the transaction or scheme uh thank you all i think it was a uh, sorry before we proceed the key takeaway of the webinar is as we discuss this scheme gives you a legal certainty and sanctity which means every all the contracts assets liabilities of an entity can get transferred to a new entity without executing any separate documents you can probably provide a the appointed date in the scheme by virtue of which you can have a retrospective effect for any kind of transaction or restructuring as we discussed there are certain tax advantages which are available if we do a transaction through a scheme which may not be available otherwise and there is potentially a saving in terms of the transaction cost which needs to be incurred for a transaction to summarize uh, we should always keep in mind that any kind of mna uh, other than the merger or demerger can also be done through a scheme whether one should consider a scheme or a traditional way of doing a scheme will depend on what are the advantages of doing it under the scheme and one need to compare that with the other consideration or cons 
around you know time required and the other majority or minority approval uh thank you all i think it was pleasure talking to uh sharing my knowledge with all of you i hope you would have enjoyed the the today's webinar and if there are any questions we can take up as a q and a session over to you samir fantastic bhavin i thought that was that was really well done why don't we give you a minute to grab your breath please grab a sip of water i think uh, there's a lot of content to deliver in a short time period um and that will also give me the chance to run through i've been furiously buzzing through all the questions that have come in and i will try and bucket them there are some on foreign exchange there are some on sebi there's quite a bit on stamp duty and tax unfortunately so uh, bear with me there okay good to go yes let's dive sure. so let's start with the fema stuff um, you refer to cross border mergers uh, can you give some and, and you spoke about some of the limitations that need to be borne in mind uh, any prior experience around those or any specific issues that you'd like to highlight on a cross border merger whether outbound or inbound yeah so you know as we all know now the fema is permitted the both ways merger which means a foreign entity can merge with india and an indian entity can also merge with an overseas entity while the rbi has permitted the outbound merger unfortunately companies act still doesn't kind of have full clarity around how the outbound mergers will operate and there are no precedents around outbound merger but there are so many precedents where a foreign entity has been merged with india which means a mauritius entity or a bvi entity has merged with india typically the most important element or two of the important condition which one need to be mindful of in case of inbound merger is are there any borrowings which are there in the overseas entity which we are merging with india if yes those borrowings needs to be complied with certain other fema guidelines which is a uh, limitations or the regulations around external commercial borrowing we just need to ensure that we comply with those regulations or there is a provision that if you are not complied today you need to comply those regulations or ensure that that loans are in compliance with ecb regulation within the two years time frame the other important element is whether that entity which is we are merging into india has any business outside india if that entity has investments outside india or if that entity is an operating entity after the merger that business or investment will get transferred to an indian entity and hence we also need to ensure that that business which an indian which will move to an indian entity or those investment which will come to an indian entity we are complying with the odi regulations which means the businesses are permitted for an indian entity to conduct as part of the odi regulations so these are the two key condition which one need to be mindful of especially in case of an inbound merger understood let me let me catch on to what you just said so suppose there is a merger between two indian companies and you realize that uh, they have overseas assets or overseas subsidiaries how does that either complicate matters for you or how does that create new avenues to think about some efficiency do you have to look at foreign law consequences or foreign tax consequences that's true so we need to look at on the implications for example if an indian entity has a either a business or investment in us if you are merging that company with any other entity the us business or us investment will also get transferred to a new entity so one need to understand the one the tax implication in that country and second if we need to follow any process especially if you have a direct business uh, as a branch in any other country whether we need to follow a specific process or take any special approvals in that country so we just need to be mindful of tax and the other regulations in that country understood and i think last question on the cross border element so let's say there are two indian companies that are merging uh, you mentioned something about foreign shareholders and particularly specific kind of instruments can only be done through a scheme um if there are foreign shareholders in the company which into which is merging and you need to issue shares to those foreign shareholders is that permissible under fema or are there some specific guidelines to be well born in mind so uh so there are two things which one need to be very careful especially one is the pricing guidelines and second is the sectoral cap depending on the sector they are involved the fema regulations permit an issuance of shares under the merger or demerger to the foreign shareholder without complying with pricing guidelines you don't need to comply with a pricing guidelines if you are doing a merger or demerger But if you are doing any other restructuring, take a capital reduction or buyback of shares, where non-residents are involved, then one also need to comply with the pricing guidelines. If you are giving an exit to them as part of the 
scheme, then the consideration which you, you can pay to a non resident server can't exceed the fair valuation. So pricing guidelines is one which you need to be mindful of. Second is the sectoral cap. So there are certain sectors where a foreign server can't exceed beyond a percentage completely, or it will require an approval beyond certain percentage. So if a merger or demerger is resulting into a situation where a non-resident will increase or the non-resident holding will increase beyond the sectoral cap, then you may need a government approval or you may not be able to do it in certain sectors where the maximum limit is only 49%. Understood. So this again, I've, there's an interesting one. Other than schemes of arrangement, what are the other kinds of restructuring that can be used for transactional work? So can you give examples? Other than the scheme of arrangement? Yes. Yeah. So obviously, the simplest would be. So again, it depends on which kind of structure we are doing. If you want to consolidate or segregate two businesses, then one way obviously is to do a scheme. If you don't, if you don't want to do a scheme, then effectively what we need to do is. The business which is there in one entity needs to get transferred to an another entity so we can do a slum sale through a agree business transfer agreement to transfer those businesses but there are certain limitations especially take an example of merger if you want to merge company a with company b and we want both the shareholders of company a and b to hold a joint entity that can only be achieved through a scheme but if you just want to consolidate the business from one entity to another entity and you don't care about the shareholding, then the slum sale can be another option where you don't need a scheme. Again, if you want to give an exit to a shareholder, one is to do a scheme to cancel the shareholding, other is to follow a process which is prescribed under the company side for buyback of shares. So, assuming you are able to comply with the conditions which are prescribed under section 66 of company side, you can do a buyback of shares where you don't need a scheme of arrangement. Again, if you have to take an example of swap of shares, you can still do a swap of shares without a scheme unless there are you no know, certain consideration for which you will do a scheme so depending on the structure there may be a possibility where you can do it through a separate uh separate through a without doing a scheme understood why don't we switch to the nclt process because there are three four questions around that so one question is um you mentioned six to twelve month time frame what is the realistic time frame uh, which is being taken uh, start to finish and uh, there's a second question that does this vary from nclt to nclt or do you have more or less similar processing times across oh uh, no so i think i'll take the second question first uh the timeline which is taken for any scheme will depend on the nclt so if you are looking at doing a scheme in the state of maharashtra the timeline can be very different than the timeline which may be taken by say nclt gujarat or nclt delhi second uh, what we have seen in today's time the realistic Assuming if you take an example of an unlisted entity for the time being, the realistic time to complete any kind of scheme where there is no listed entity involved and assuming for a moment no sectoral approval required because if you need a sectoral approval, again, the timeline can undergo a change. You should assume six to nine months, I would say, is a realistic time to complete a scheme uh, in the state of Maharashtra. If there are any sector approval required or if you have a listed entity involved, then the timeline can increase further. Okay. Let's say there is a minority shareholder or let's say there's a creditor who's unhappy with the scheme and did not support it during the meeting. If they were to contest the scheme before the NCLT, how should clients be dealing with that and what is the risk? Yeah, so uh, take an example again, if a minority shareholder because there could be different reasons for which minority shareholder may object the scheme. Generally, the most common approach or common reason where people probably will object is the valuation. If you are merge, merging company A with company B and you are issuing shares of company B to the minority shareholder of company A, they may have an objection in terms of the valuation which has been conducted. And again, you know, when you are doing an analysis, if there is a, a concern that you know valuation can be a challenge, can be challenged, probably one of the way to address is to have a two valuation report on when you are approaching a board. So when a board is approving a scheme, try and obtain a valuation report from two different chartered accountants or merchant banker so that you can substantiate that the valuation has been done in a fair manner. So that's one way to approach. Typically for creditors, his objection would be that his liability or claim has not been admitted by company A. What we have seen typically is that whenever you're doing the restructuring, where you're not looking at doing a settlement with creditor, we should specifically add up undertaking or a provision in the scheme that the rights of the creditors continues as is even after the scheme is complete. So even if you are doing a segregation of business or merger, we should kind of provide an undertaking that his rights, whether, you know, whatever 
is it was his right in a company a would continue to be the same in company b and what you have seen is based on this kind of undertaking nclts have been comfortable you know approving the scheme saying that there is no restructuring or settlement which is happening with the creator and whatever happens to his claim ultimately by normal course of law uh, would be uh, bound by would be bound by the other company understood okay uh, just in terms of uh, the process you mentioned this entire uh, retrospective application so there are a few questions on that uh, a what's the difference between appointed date and effective date or is there any difference at all now no no both are very different so effective date is a legal concept appointed is a concept which is mainly followed for income tax and accounting purpose so the main reason for doing writing and appointed is to kind of classify or clarify that once the transaction has been approved by the tribunal and once we have got all the approvals for implement the scheme which is the date from which you want those transaction to take effect in the books of account and since this transaction will be recorded in the books of account from the appointed date for tax purpose also this is treated as if the transaction has been done from the appointed date so even if a transaction gets completed say in next financial year you can still have a transaction which is recorded in the books in the current financial and for tax purpose also this will be considered so appointed it is a concept to say from which that i will record this in the accounts and for which which will also be considered as a date for income tax purposes effective date is a date which is a date which says that from which date the transaction scheme is deemed to be approved or is effective as we discussed scheme requires multiple level of approvals so once we have all the approvals in place the day you get a last approval and file the tribunal order with the registrar of companies is the date which is considered as a date when the scheme of arrangement is deemed to be effective so it's a legal concept to say from that day scheme is effective and approved by the tribunal but the appointed date can still work for accounting and tax purpose understood okay great um uh, just moving over to a few questions on process there's a question on what kind of diligence should be done before a scheme so i would say the diligence exercise especially would should still remain the same whether you want to do a transaction through a scheme or you want to do a transaction through a through a traditional way because diligence around financial diligence tax diligence or the legal diligence of the target which you want to acquire should still be the same and with the same rigor which you would otherwise do the only additional provisions which one need to be mindful of is to understand the implications under various regulations when you do a transaction under a under an agreement or a normal process versus a scheme so the analysis would be around what are the implications of the transaction if you have to do a transaction in a different way or the diligence exercise or the rigor should still remain the same whether you want to do a transaction through a scheme or otherwise because if you want to acquire a target you need to know what are the the history of those transactions what are the litigations or what is the the financial situation of that entity understood um usually if suppose the 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 company which is going to merge has esops uh, how would you uh, address that in a scheme what's the correct way uh, to address that in a scheme so uh, so what we need to be careful is you know once there is an esop scheme in company a which is going to merge with say company b the terms of the disop will definitely change once the merger is happened because the merge entity will have a different valuation the number of percentage which you may want to give in a to an employee in company a may be different than the company b so this company b also has its or its set of shareholders which are already there so what we typically advise client is to understand or agree the revise understanding with the employees that once the company is merged what would be the revised terms of isop which would be given to this employees of company a and document that as part of the scheme which means you don't need to follow a separate process to amend the isop scheme the moment the scheme is approved the revised isop terms also become effective without doing a separate process to amend the amend the isop terms so again that's the beauty of scheme you can get a single window clearance for all kind of approvals which you require take an example another example is change of name if you want to change the name of the company once the merger is happened you can actually write that in the scheme of arrangement without actually following a separate process to do a change of name so you get a single window clearance for the scheme whatever clauses you are written in the scheme kind of becomes effective the day scheme is approved understood okay there are there are quite a lot of uh, there are quite a lot of tax questions i think some of them 
we briefly covered, but let's let's just run through. Uh, there's one specifically on section 79, and uh, I believe that is to do with carry forward of losses. If I'm not wrong, I'll let you explain okay. uh, whether section 79 will be triggered if the shareholding changes more than 51% in case of a merger. Uh, in case of a merger, there's a separate provision of your section 72, which deals with the the you know what will happen to a brought forward losses if there's a losses in company A, which is merging with company B. So again, there could be two scenarios: company A, which has a tax losses, uh, which is merging with company B. Section 72 provides that if a company A, which is merging, as is an industrial undertaking, then those losses can be continued in the hands of company B. Subject to certain conditions, there are certain conditions which are prescribed, which one need to comply with. Take a different situation. Again, same example: company A has a brought forward losses, company B doesn't have. You are merging company B with company A, so you are not merging an entity which has losses. You are merging an entity which is profit making into company A. In which situation section 79 would trigger, since there will be a change of shareholding of company A. If that shareholding has changed more than 51 percent. By virtue of company B merging with company A, then there will be an impact on the broad forward losses of company A. Again, assuming that company A is an unlisted entity. Okay. Uh, and post the merger, do earlier shareholders need to continue for a few years? If they don't, what are the consequences? Uh, not really. There's no requirement that the only requirement for a tax note merger is that the 75% of shareholders of the transferor company should become shareholders of transferee company by virtue of merger. So there's to be an issuance of shares pursuant to a merger by transferee company to the shareholders of transfer company. But once the shares are issued to the shareholders, they are free to transfer the shares even immediately. There is no requirement to continue holding that shares uh, for a near future. And again, uh, whatever was the period of holding of their shares in the transfer company, what was their cost in the transfer company? They get an advantage or continuity of that period of holding as well as cost. So even if they sell the shares very next day, it may still be long term if they're holding shares of transfer company for long term. It doesn't become a short term. Okay, superb. Okay, there's one question which I completely don't understand. So I'm just going to read it out verbatim. Please pick it up. Is the amendment to section 50B of Income Tax Act only applicable to slump sale? Uh, what measures can a company take to mitigate this tax impact? Uh, obviously, the the provisions of Section 50B are only applicable in case of slum cell. Obviously, the slum cell definition has been widened in last couple of years by the finance bill. There are different kind of slum cell, like slump exchange may also get covered under the slum cell. And there will be tax implications when we do a slum cell from company A to company B, as per this as per the provisions of Section 50B. Again, I don't think uh, we can say that there is an immediate answer to say how do we mitigate the tax. It will depend on what is the objective of doing a slum sale. Is this slum sale to a third party, or are we looking at doing a restructuring or segregation within the group? Because the objective could be different. If I'm selling it to a third party, then I need to receive a consideration which I otherwise would require. When you're, if you're doing an internal restructuring, you may consider other options since the value still remains within the group. So you know, again, depending on the facts and the objective, one needs to look at if there is a better way to to segregate the business in a tax efficient way. Understood. OK, uh, I have a couple of more questions and then a few philosophical questions which have come through. So just to cover the detailed ones first. Appointed date, how far back can it be uh, from the effective date? So uh, there is a circular which has been issued by Ministry of Corporate Affairs, uh, which kind of says that the appointed date should not be older than 12 months from the day board has approved the scheme. So it's not linked to effective date. Is linked to the day board approves. So if a board is approving a scheme today, it can't be more than 12 months older. You can still keep a date which is more than 12 months older, but then you need to give a rational to the tribunal. And if tribunal is comfortable with the rational which has been given for the appointed date which is more than 12 months older, tribunal has a power to approve appointed date even which is older than 12 months. But typically, 12 months is a period which has been prescribed by by the Ministry of Corporate Affairs. Understood. Um, there's a question. Is it beneficial to make the transferor company a wholly owned subsidiary of the transferee company before commencing the process? Uh, answer is yes or no. Again, it depends whether the transferor company is owned by a third party 
or is owned by by within the group because if it is owned by a third party and if you're looking at the consideration taken case study one where we wanted to trans merge the company x and company y and make shareholders of both the companies as a joint partner in those scenarios it doesn't make sense to make company x as a subsidiary of company y because the for which you need to do a swap your shareholders of company x needs to all shares in company y which may be a taxable transaction for them and if we can do a merger why would you do an additional step to make them as a subsidiary but if you are looking at doing a transaction within the group then there are certain advantages in terms of a lower transaction cost if you merge 100% subsidiary with parent and again under the company sec you can potentially do away with the approval of tribunal when you are merging a 100% subsidiary with a parent with in certain situations so in case of a group restructuring one can consider to make a transfer a company as a subsidiary of transferring company before initiating a merger or probably not in case of a third party third party transaction understood okay so now as i said there are a couple of slightly more uh, drawing board is question. So, in in terms of the global slowdown, we've obviously seen an impact at some level on deal activity. Uh, from your perspective, uh, m &A and schemes in particular, what do you think is going to be the extent of impact this uh, so-called global slowdown will have? So, you know, again, the scheme is a byproduct of m &A, but The topic which we are dis discussing is how can we do an m &A through a scheme of arrangement? which means scheme is in that sense a result or an outcome of I mean, how do we achieve the transaction? Or if there's a global slowdown around the MNA activity, obviously it will have an impact on the on these schemes because if the transactions in general kind of reduces or slow, is there's a slowdown in, in the MNA activity, I would assume it will have a direct impact on the schemes. Obviously there's one more element of scheme which we have not discussed today. You can also consider doing schemes of arrangement for internal restructuring. So this is the another part of restructuring, which means groups may do an in-house or internal restructuring through a scheme, which can still continue. But if one is to look at scheme in the context of MNA, I would say there will be a direct correlation. Understood. Uh, you mentioned six to 12 months, Bhavin. So obviously it's a pretty long time to have the MNA deal disclosed in public arena. Who's the buyer? Who's the seller? What are the terms? Um, and especially if there are competitors, if, if there could be people who could look to upset the apple cart. Um, what are the kind of deals that you rec that you usually see people are comfortable, buyers are comfortable from a risk of disclosure perspective doing through this entire m &A situation? So, yeah, so few of the transactions which, which we have seen very common where the m &A has been done through a scheme. Uh, one is obviously segregation of businesses, either with an intent to do a third party exit subsequently. Since we are doing a segregation of business, we are just splitting the entity into two, but the sale of the sales of the new entity to a an buyer is not disclosed to the shareholder. We are only giving the terms of segregation of business or not the terms of exit, which you want to do. So this is what we have seen typically being done through a scheme. Another example where people have used schemes very frequently is unlocking value from a listed entity. So if you want to split the listed entity businesses into multiple businesses for the for unlocking a value probably the only way to do that without doing an ipo is to through a scheme and there are enough precedents where people have demerged businesses from one listed entity and created multiple business listed entities to segregate the businesses this is something which we have seen very common there are few transactions not more where people actually so if you just want to consolidate a business without actual money being in, being involved where there are two groups like what often an idea wants to come together to consider the businesses probably while those scheme may be in public domain or uh, you may come to an answer that scheme probably is the best way to to implement that considering the multiple regulations which may come into play in in third party considerations understood so let me just put this last question down so and, and then maybe we'll close the q a um I can tell you there are some very interesting ones asking about cost of acquisition, continuity, etc. So hopefully we'll we'll have to pick up on some of those offline. Um, just in terms of let's say there's a there's a company in India whose shares are held by an offshore corporation. That offshore corporation undergoes a merger internationally. It merges into some other company. As a result, the shares of the Indian company are proposed to be transferred. 
any implications in India that you'd like to talk through? Maybe, maybe tax, maybe foreign exchange. Yeah. So uh, from a, under a tax, there are certain exemptions given when there is a merger between the two foreign entity by virtue of which the shares of an Indian entity gets transferred. So take an example: if a U.S. entity is holding shares of an Indian entity, and if that U.S. entity is merging with another U.S. entity, then transfer of shares of an Indian entity is specifically exempt, provided the that merger is tax neutral in U.S. And the shareholders of U.S. entity which is merging at least continue to hold certain percentage, which I think is 25 percent in the merged entity. So there is an exemption available. The another implication which one need to be mindful of, which generally people kind of ignore, is would there be implications in the hands of the shareholders of U.S. entity? There could be implications in the hands of the shareholders of U.S. entity when U.S. is merging, if U.S. entity is deriving substantial value from Indian assets. So unless the India is not substantial, there may not be implications. But if India is a significant value of the U.S. entity, even the shareholders of U.S. entity may have implications in India. So one should just be mindful of that as well. I think uh, that's that's been fantastic, Pavin. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm afraid we'll have to complete the Q&A on that uh, front. Um, there are quite a few others. We've got them in the system. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your really overwhelming participation. I doubt we've been able to take so many questions before this, uh, and, and we will follow up. Uh, before we conclude today, uh, I'd like to request each one of you to respond to the poll slide. It should be on your screens now. Uh, we we typically collect this feedback. It's very helpful. It, it helps us uh, calibrate our efforts. And what we will do is after this webinar, by email, we will follow up, send a short form. It takes not more than a minute to complete. And it will help us uh, with a very valuable insight on, on what your thoughts are, how you felt we fared, and how we can fare a little better. So thank you very much. I guess uh, many thanks to people who took the time to participate in the poll. And uh, if we just go back a little bit to that slide, Bhavin, which has uh, our mug shots <laughs> and our contact details. And, and I, I actually took a few key takeaways as well. Uh, very thought provoking presentation. Thank you very much, Bhavin. Mm -hmm. And what, what I really gathered was that uh, schemes have been given a specific treatment under all laws, whether it is takeover, companies act, tax, and duty, um, it, it there are several things that happen by operation of law, and therefore they deserve special treatment. And therefore, there is a tremendous amount of flexibility and innovation that you can utilize to achieve the stated commercial objective. But that's where a lot of prior experience and knowledge and foresight behind how the eventual objective will be arrived at, say, six to twelve months later. Um, we made the point of uh, pricing in the entire risk of disclosure to competitors, etc. So one can't really overemphasize the requirement to have experienced advisors by your side. Um, so with that, again, Bhavin, thank you very much for the presentation and many thanks also to our live and recorded audience. Uh, we certainly hope you found this webinar interesting and uh, we look forward to hearing from you by way of the feedback. Should you need anything, please do not hesitate to contact us. Our contact details are on the slide in front of you. And thank you very much for your attendance today. And we look forward to seeing you again at future webinars. Thank you. Thank you.